Amen. Amen. Well, good to be saved, right? Amen. Good to be in church, isn't it? Yes. I mean, if you've been outside, it's really good to be in church. And this, this weather makes coming to see me like a positive, doesn't it? And um, it is. It's good to be uh, inside. And this is the warm day, you know. It's supposed to get cold after this. I'm telling you, Thursday we head for Florida. And uh, we will not miss you. I won't even think about you. Um, I'll open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> Genesis 22. It's a verse that, uh, that we, actually it's a passage of scripture that we are all familiar with. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I thought about it and thought about it, and um, uh, and we were Kathy and I were just in Israel not long ago between uh, between rounds. Um, we were supposed to be fifteen people go, and I think uh, six of us, five of us went. Ten of them bailed out. They all thought they're going to get killed by Palestinian missiles, and and somebody said, well, "What do you think?" And I said, Pfft. "I said by the time we get there, the Palestinians will shut off all their missiles. The 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 Jews will have you know pound them into the sand." I said there'll be like two fighters between the last round. Others be leaning on the ropes, breathing hard, and so we came in and got out of dodge, and then they started the sec second round or next round. But um, a couple of things over there that I saw, and I'll just mention it a couple of times this morning, and then I won't <clears throat> I won't belabor it uh, on you. But um, <clears throat> but in Genesis chapter 22, we all know uh, what takes place here. Verse one it says this: It came to pass uh, after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he, and he said, Behold, here I am. <clears throat> and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Uh, let me ask you a question. Was his only son? Nope, no. nope he wasn't. So what's a mistake in the Bible? Nope, the Bible's right. Because it was the only son that counted. Because yeah, he was the child of promise. So if there was no Isaac, Ishmael didn't even matter. Could somebody tell them? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that's why they get bombs, you know. But... Um, uh, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and, uh, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, uh, which I tell thee of. Now, guys, you know Abraham is called the friend of God, uh, and he is. And uh, you have probably, in your, in your life, had the Lord uh, request of you something that was tough, that was hard, and it maybe took you a while before you said, okay, okay, right? I mean, you said you did the right thing, but it just took you a little bit. The most amazing thing is that in verse 2, the Lord says, I want you to take your only son, the son that you love, and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. Look at verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. <laughs> now, I, my dad would have done that, okay, for a whole different reason. But, um, <clears throat> and, and saddled his ass and took uh, two of the young men uh, with him and Isaac, his son, and claved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up. I went to the place... Uh, of which God had told him. Uh, look at verse 2. It says he's going to take you to the land of Moriah. We know this takes place on the Mount Moriah. And uh, we're going to look at that mountain, all right, in, in um, a little bit in Bible history. Um, I want you to keep this in mind. Anybody here ever been to Pikes Peak? Okay, okay. <clears throat> you know, somebody says, uh, we went to Pikes Peak one time. They said, what's at the top of it? Um, uh, a souvenir store. Uh, what's at the top of Pikes Peak? A parking lot. Uh, what's at the top of Pikes Peak? Uh, a little train station. We took the Cog Railroad. Because you know the way I was driving. Uh, what's at the top of Pikes Peak? There's all kinds of things. In other words, you ever think about this? If you're standing here and Pikes Peak starts there, if you walk three feet up, you're on Pikes Peak. Correct? You may not be at the very top. <clears throat> and so I want you to keep in mind that this is all Mount Moriah. Um, and, and my question when I read this passage was, where did Abraham make this offering? I can think of two locations. He either did it where the temple was going to be someday, uh, or he did it where the Lord was going to be crucified. Uh, and I thought, so which one was it? And be honest with you, the first thing I said was this, has to be Calvary, because this is the father offering the son that he loves. That's what the Lord did with uh, the Lord, uh, God did with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's got to be Calvary. Uh, and, then, and then as I thought about it, <clears throat> Actually, I changed that uh, prior to the trip to Israel based on this. Jesus Christ died for our sins, correct? Okay. But, but the, the, the uh, offerings that were made at the temple were you take your best, your firstborn, your, your uh, you know, without spot or blemish, and it is a sacrifice to the person that's given it. And so I said, well, I think maybe instead uh, that it was, um, uh, it was uh, the temple mount. And we're going to talk about this little piece of real estate, and I'll explain why 
there is no way on earth this could have taken place at Calvary. You say, oh, I think it did. Think what you want. I will show you why there is. I'll tell you why. When this took place, there was no Calvary. Now, we'll get to that. Uh, I want you to go with me, if you will. We're going to turn to a lot of scripture. Uh, look at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 24. That's right after 2 Samuel 23. This piece of real estate, somewhere along the line, <clears throat> Aruna gets it. Now, uh, let me tell you about uh, this. This is all rock. I mean, it is really all rock. And, and uh, Aruna used it as a threshing floor because that's what you need. You need rock. Uh, and so, so Aruna's threshing floor was right here. This is where the temple later was. This is where uh, the Dome of the Rock is. Uh, but um, uh, it, was, uh, it was Aruna's. Uh, look at verse 18. Uh, verses 18, this is where the, the plague was um, uh, on, in the nation of Israel. And Gad came that day uh, to David and said unto him, Go up, <clears throat> rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So, so to this point, it's just a piece of, it's a hilltop and it's a piece of property. You have heard uh, Jerusalem called the city set on a hill. Yeah, pop your ears. When you're driving up there, I mean, your ears pop. That's, that's how much of it is. If you can think of Jerusalem, put Jerusalem here and think of a U around it. Uh, and, and what is around it in a U shape uh, uh, down the east, west, and, and south sides are three valleys. It has three valleys around it. You've got the Hinnom, uh, or no, I'm sorry, you got uh, Kidron here and, uh, and Hinnom here. I can't remember what the other one is. <clears throat> but, um, but this is just literally a piece of real estate. Uh, keep your place here. But go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And in verse 8, and I'm giving you these because um, even though you know, the name Moriah does not uh, appear, some of you are going to want the, the references. But again, this is the same thing, um, uh, starting verse 8. Uh, and David said unto God, I have uh, sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Uh, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And then this is the parallel passage to uh, 2 Samuel. Uh, look at um, 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And look right at verse, again, we look at this. Look at verse 18. It says, Aruna was the Jebusite. Uh, the, the, the city that we now know as Jerusalem was once known as Jebus. People that lived there were Jebusites, all right? So whenever you read in your Bible, you hear Jebus, uh, you're, hearing, you're hearing about the city of Jerusalem. Uh, get um, Joshua chapter 15. Verse 63, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah <clears throat> could not drive them out. Uh, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah uh, at Jerusalem unto this day. So I'm just letting you know that, that uh, Jebus and Jerusalem are synonymous. Uh, chapter 18. 1828, very last verse. Uh, and Zela, uh, uh, Eliph, and Jebusi, which is Jerusalem. So, so prior to it, kind of coming up on the radar scripturally, uh, it, it, was a, it was a city of the Jebusites, uh, and that particular location is the place where Aruna, who's just a farmer, had some place to, to uh, winnow his wheat. Uh, it was all stone. That's what he wanted. You want to you wanna winnow the wheat on something that is so hard. You don't want it going down in the grass where you have to get it. So, so uh, in fact, Jerusalem is all rock. It is all rock. And so um, uh, it was good for that purpose. Uh, look at Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1 and verse 21. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Uh, look at chapter 19. Nineteen verse ten. Uh, but the man would not tarry that night, uh, but he arose and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. So uh, in, in, in verse 11, it mentions the Jebusite. So, 
So this was, uh, at first, this was nothing but a, a farmer's piece of property. That is a rock. Uh, that rock is sacred, of course, to the Jews. It's sacred to uh, a bunch of bomb makers. But, um, uh, and, and, but it's this piece of property where the guy winnowed his wheat. And then you saw in 2 Samuel chapter 24, David bought it. Correct? He bought it. And that's where uh, he made the offering that stopped the plague that had been going on for three days because he had sinned against the Lord <clears throat> and, uh, and numbered Israel. Uh, it comes up again. Look at 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And 1 Samuel chapter 17, <clears throat> after David kills Goliath. Verse 54, he takes the head off of Goliath and it said, uh, uh, and David took the head of the, of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So I don't know what it was about Jerusalem that got David's attention. It was not the dwelling place of King Saul. Saul was in Gibeah. Uh, look at, um, I want to say, uh, uh, let's look at 1 Samuel 11. Yeah, 1 Samuel chapter 11, and this is right after Saul became king. Uh, you know the story, verse 1, then Nahash the Ammonite uh, came up and encamped against Gil, uh, uh, Jabesh Gilead. Uh, and all the men of uh, Jabesh said unto Nahash, uh, make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And look what it says in verse 4. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul. So uh, Gibeah is uh, kind of a, if you look at Jerusalem, uh, Gibeah is kind of a 11 o'clock if, Saul, if uh, Jerusalem is the center. So, so what you've got is you've got, uh, you've got a, <clears throat> you've got a city here. That was Jebus to the Jebusites. Of course, it is, uh, and this is, um, <clears throat> this is actually Mount of Olives right over here. This is the, the um, Kidron Valley. And, uh, and Saul didn't dwell here. Now, this is right here is that rock. That is not sacred, though something does take place uh, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, take a look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. And look at verse 10. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Uh, seven years reigned he in Hebron and 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. So, so it is David. Well, well, we know God had his attention uh, on that place in Genesis chapter 22, correct? David gets his attention. Uh, it, gets, it gets David's attention because that's where he's told to go, which is a spot that apparently God likes. Now, you're going to hear me say this again. Uh, we're walking around Jerusalem, my wife and I. And um, I, look, we love Jerusalem, correct? We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right, we do. But, I, but there's nothing about it that you're going to go, wow, I'd like to buy a house here. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Didn't God make the entire planet? Amen. Yeah, we're walking around Jerusalem and, I, and I'm looking at this. I mean, there's just nothing desirable about this place. It is a rock surrounded by dirt and heat. Uh, and I told Kathy, I said, did, did God not know about Hawaii? Because I am telling you, I mean, I really, I can think of a bunch of places in Hawaii the Lord could really get excited over, all right? Uh, and he got excited over a piece of rock. <clears throat> uh, look at um, 2 Samuel chapter 5. And in 2 Samuel chapter 5, Uh, I was in First Samuel chapter five, which would have read completely different. Trust me. Second Samuel chapter five. Uh, take a look at verse six, and, and you need to see this, uh, guys. Look, we live in a nation that is run by spirits. All right, and and be, you know you can't fall into water and not get some on you, and you can't live in a nation that is submerged in spirits without some of those having an effect on you. 
Uh, and so you've got, uh, you've got spirits going around that talk about, well, you know, don't say this and don't say that. Uh, and even though we, we claim freedom of speech, even though we say we know what's right, uh, sometimes you're still a little bit hesitant. You feel, you say, what is it? That's a spiritual attack. Uh, and, and America is run by, by two groups, uh, overbearing women and effeminate men. That's really true. That's true. You, listen, you know what men do? They go, on the, they go on the field and they beat each other. I'm talking about a game. They beat each other till one team wins. And then a woman goes, oh, look, they're hurting each other. And then they grab their husband by the ear and go, John, make them stop. And he goes, oh, you're hurting each other. Let's not have a winner. So when you hear a man talk like that, he is run by a woman. That is the truth. And, and here's what it says. Look at verse uh, 6. <clears throat> this place is, is still owned by the Jebusites. And the king, David, and his men went up to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Now, guys, look, I am not against the blind and the lame. But you see what he's trying to do? You know, men think with their brains. Don't get mad at me, ladies, but women think with their hearts. We need that. We need someone to think. Anybody that's had a father wants a mother. I mean, you know, you can only screw your arm back on so many times. You would like somebody to say, I feel sorry for you. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, we're in this age where you have to have compassion. Do you ever notice you have to have compassion? They've misplaced our compassion. You have to have compassion for some guy who has been a pervert all his life and he's dying with his teddy bear in his hand and sores all over him. I don't have compassion for that. I don't have compassion for an alcoholic. I'm sorry. Well, it's a disease. Yeah, it's, he, he worked all his life to catch it. And, and we're told to have compassion for the wrong people. And so here's what the Jebusites think. They're, they're, gonna, they're trying to pull the, the overbearing woman, effeminate man thing. They'll think, oh, you know, David doesn't want CNN to say... David's killing the blind and the lame. And so David's going to go, oh man, what do I do? I can't kill the blind and the lame. Uh, you're talking to David. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of, of David. And David said on that day, whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief captain. You say, you mean he hates blind and lame people? No, he didn't. But what he's saying is, nobody is going to guilt trip me into not taking this city. Amen. Now, I'm telling you something, guys. When you start with, look, if you are already afraid to say what you believe, you are, you are already a slave. And you get this, uh, well, we don't want to say that. And, well, we don't want to upset some people. You need to upset some people. You know, I said something some time ago, and a guy contacted me. He said, well, aren't you concerned about somebody being un offended? And I think a man told me that. You know, look, look, I mean, <laughs> whining men. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got Generation X, and then right after it's Generation Wine. <laughs> and that is all they do. Well, you know, nobody appreciates it. And it's just a bunch of whining men. And, and I was talking with David last night, you know, I said, you know, the Bible says that when you see the evil coming, a wise man hides himself. That's when you see the evil coming. Not when somebody warns you that they're going to get you. That's Nehemiah. That's when the guy said, oh, you better not build this wall anymore because they're going to kill you. You better come and hide in the temple with me. Come to the house of God. And he says, you know, I'm just not doing it. It was later he found out the guy was a plant. So I'm going to tell you something, guys. If you let what somebody is going to say about you, or if you say that they won't like you, will it be the right people that don't like you? You got to understand, they're just some folks you got to make sure they don't like you. Amen. <laughs> I, uh, I was someplace and, and, and some guy said, he mentioned a preacher, I don't know him, you know, he says, uh, he didn't like you. Like, you know, I feel bad about that. <laughs> and, um, okay, done feeling bad. But anyway, he, um, he said, that guy don't like you. And I said, uh, well, you know, I said, well, what's his problem? He goes, oh, he didn't like your stand on the King James Bible. I said, well, good. That's a guy I don't want to like me. You know, if you guys don't like me, I'm going to worry. Of course, it won't do you a bit of good to come up and try it now. <laughs> Take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 6. <clears throat> so David bought that piece of property. Uh, he later, I'm sorry, later buys that piece of property, but he takes that city. Uh, and when he brings the ark up, look where he brings it. Um, well, chapter 6. Verse 12, and it, and it was told David, saying, uh, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed, Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of, the, of God 
uh, of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark uh, of God from the house of Obed-Edom uh, into the city of David with gladness. So he brings, this is, this city is, is the, the city of David's heart. It really is. So he brings the ark to Jerusalem. Uh, this is where he later buys the threshing floor. And, and God starts like in this place, or I shouldn't say God starts like, and he, he apparently always has. Uh, look at Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 3. And we learned this in verse one, when Solomon builds that temple, <clears throat> it says this, then Solomon uh, began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. So this is uh, over here is what we know as the Eastern gate. This is, uh, that's East. Uh, and so at that end, that is where Solomon builds the temple. So he builds it right on top of that, that piece of ground that David bought, uh, which has become famous in Scripture. Uh, take a look at three other Scripture in uh, the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm 2 and get Psalm 2, Psalm 87, and Psalm 132. Psalm 2, 87, and 132. And in Psalm 2, <clears throat> uh, God is talking, he says this, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And that is, uh, that is the top of Mount Moriah. That is where the temple is. Uh, 87 and verse 5. And of Zion it shall be said, uh, This and that man was born in her, uh, and the highest himself shall establish her. Uh, chap uh, chapter, or, I'm sorry, Psalm 132. In verse 13, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. I will explain that choosing later, all right? It's an amazing thing. Uh, like I said, I'm telling you, I'm looking at it and thinking, why does God want this? Uh, but he does. Now, take a look at uh, Luke chapter 33. And you know your Bible, <clears throat> you know it well enough to know that this is the single only place uh, in the Bible that the word Calvary appears. They're going to crucify the Lord, Luke chapter 23. And it says this in verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, I told you that there was no way that uh, uh, Abraham could have offered Isaac at Calvary because it did not exist. Well, that is a fact. It did not exist. Here's what you find. You find right here. Uh, you ever do this? I'm sure you have. You're driving on the interstate, and they put the interstate, they put the interstate through right here and cut the hill out. You ever see that? You're driving through part of a hill, one real high wall, one little, you know, rock wall. That's where Calvary is. Um, when David, or I'm sorry, when Solomon built that temple, they started quarrying stone right at the edge of the wall. When you walk out, or you're on this side, of the, you're on the west side of the city, the, the, the uh, city wall, you're looking up easily from here to, to the top of that wall where the, where the foundation of the wall of Jerusalem is. What you're looking at here is all quarried stone. And they literally, Solomon quarried a piece of, uh, a, a swath right through the hill of Mount Moriah. And in doing that on, on the low side here, It created what we know as Calvary. Calvary is in, it, it's in the, it's in the, I'm sorry, you can't find any place in the Bible that says Mount Calvary. And I'm still going to sing on a hill called Mount Calvary, okay? I'm still going to sing about a hill called Calvary. There's no hill called Calvary. It is Calvary. And, and so the Lord, uh, we, uh, now when you go to this, um, you go in a roundabout way. We had a Muslim tour guide. I kept an eye on him. <laughs> And when they, when they bring you to, uh, to Calvary uh, and the garden, <clears throat> uh, they bring you, the, the Muslim won't go in. They hand you off to some other folks. Well, these folks are saved. They're just saved as you and I. Uh, and we got this guy from Sweden, I think, Sweden, uh, saved fella. Uh, here's what he says. He says, now, he said, we believe what we're going to show you today is the Calvary where the Lord was crucified. We believe the grave we're going to show you is the grave uh, where he was buried and rose again. And he said, now, 
He said, maybe this is, we have, we have reason to believe it is, but he said, maybe it was and maybe it was not. But he said, you know, whether this is the place where he came, that's not what's important. It is why he came. And this guy started witnessing to us. Man, I, that was the most precious moment I had in that whole time. Just to, this guy just cared about our soul. And uh, in fact, I got saved. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I gave it a couple of times. And after about the third time, I think I made it. But um, but anyway, uh, here's what he, so, so what you do is you walk, you're walking around and you're actually, you're up on top of this hill here and you're looking down on Calvary down there. It's behind a bus station. Uh, and, and so you're looking down at Calvary. A couple things. Number one, he said, and, and think about this again, guys, I'm sorry. I like this. I like, I like this picture of Calvary. A hill called Mount Calvary. And... You know, we always kind of have like the Lord's cross here and the other two like, like looking at him. That's not how it was. Do you know where the Romans crucified people? Look, the Romans, the Romans were smarter than Americans. They knew that capital punishment was a deterrent to crime. All right? I mean, tell me something. Those three guys over in France, are they going to kill anybody anymore? Okay, the world's a safer place, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and so where they crucified them is they crucified them along the roads the, the roads leading in and out of town. What would you think in those days? You're traveling to a city and maybe you're a con man. Maybe you're a thief. And you're walking up and you, and you see about five crosses and you go, whoa, what is thief. That would, that would really kind of get your mind on it. Uh, and what this fellow said, he said, the Lord wasn't crucified up here, but he was crucified with the skull as the backdrop. And most likely, they were just three crosses abreast, okay? Because this is, um, uh, this Calvary is about 100 yards outside the city. Was he not crucified outside the city? <coughs> it's, he's, he's about uh, 100 yards outside the city. And then right around the corner uh, is the garden tomb. Um, and I believe it, okay? I, I do. I mean, look, I know, you know, we say... Uh, uh, we don't buy everything that somebody says, this is, you know, I walked today where Jesus walked. And uh, Jesus probably, well, he probably walked all over the place, but, but he might not have been doing what you think he was doing, you know, whenever you walked there. Um, but I do believe that this is Calvary. And I do believe right around the corner, this guy says, here's where we believe this is the garden. Number one, he said, uh, there's a wine fat here, a, a, a wine press where they pressed the grapes to, to make the juice. And he said, they had those in a garden. For the second thing, though, over here, I'm talking down the valley and around, and way over here is the Jewish cemetery. Cemetery. It's about three miles away, which even that, you know, that's a few minutes in your car. But doesn't it say they buried him close? And when you go into this, uh, in this garden, it's not a graveyard. There's one tomb. It was a tomb in a garden. Because back in those days, and I don't know how it is over there, but you can still do that. I don't know. Don't, don't acknowledge this if you're from Kentucky. But, um, uh, you know, it is a strange state. It is. And um, I still think they ought to build the wall along the south of Texas and the south of Ohio. But uh, uh, my wife uh, has a sister, and her, her older, oldest sister, and she had a son living in Kentucky. And she called to talk to him several years ago. Uh, and his wife answered, and she said, um, oh, I'm sorry, but my daddy died, and, and uh, he's making funeral arrangements. Oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. She called three days later, and she said, can I talk to him now? And she said, oh, I'm sorry, he's out and back burying daddy. Because <laughs> in Kentucky, you can still bury him in your yard, which should make really interesting things when you go to sell the place. <clears throat> yeah, uh, grass grows real good right here. Don't do potatoes. But, um, and so what you had is you had a garden right here, right around the corner. Uh, you had the garden, uh, and then, um, uh, and so the Lord was, he was crucified. Now, here's uh, one of the things that I, uh, this, I learned this on my own, not uh, at the, our guide. But, um, you know, here's what they did. They would bury him in Israel. They would bury somebody. Where am I supposed to be done? Okay. Okay. Um, they would bury people in Israel in a tomb and leave them there for about a year. Then they would 
get what's remaining of them and take it away and bury it in a more permanent place. And it was kind of like, I don't know how they were thinking, but the sepulcher was actually kind of like the first stage uh, of Jewish burial. That's why I remember it said uh, it was a grave what? Where never a man had laid. I mean, you, you, you don't think that, do you? I mean, would you say, uh, you, I'm going to buy, I want to buy a, a, a cemetery plot. Well, okay, well, we got a guy in it right now, but, you know, he'll be gone six months. And... <laughs> I mean, we don't want to reuse a hole in the ground. And so I, uh, I was doing some study on the grave, this, this grave here. <clears throat> and it said that um, uh, they sent forensic scientists in and, and dusted it. And they said they, have, they could not find in the dust, they could not find uh, the DNA that a human body had ever laid in that grave. In other words, there had never been a human decay. In, and it is plainly a grave. Now, I say this, I don't care if after the Lord came out of the grave, I don't care if they buried 14 goats in it, right? Because he still left an empty grave. In fact, I, I said this, guys, you know, why do you want a religion that can't get the founder out of a hole in the ground? Why would you want to be a Muslim that couldn't get, that couldn't get Muhammad out of the ground? Why would you be a Mormon that couldn't get Joe Smith out of the ground? Why would you be a Catholic that couldn't get every pope but one and he's headed for the ground? Right? Why, would you, why do you want a religion that couldn't get the founder? The head of the, of the Jehovah Witnesses is just a pile of dust. And Confucius is a pile of dust. And Buddha is a rather large pile of dust. <clears throat> but um, and, and you know what the neatest thing is? When you, you go into this grave, they have a, little, uh, they have a wooden door on it now. Uh, and, and you're looking at the place that was hewn out of, it's hewn out of rock. Uh, and you look at the place where the Lord lay. And when you turn it back around, uh, where the door is open, it says... He is risen. But I'll tell you what, it's, if you want to shout, that's a real good place. That's really a good place. So here's the thing. Uh, but this is what, this is what uh, uh, astonished me. Um, we're standing up here and we're looking down at Calvary and, uh, and at, this, uh, at this tomb. And then we went back to our hotel. We were staying in the Muslim section. Um, that's just how it worked out. We, we actually ran a lot uh, between the, the hotel and... Uh, <laughs> In Jerusalem, somehow they could tell we didn't look like Arabs. But, um, um, and we've been walking into the city. We've been walking into Damascus Gate over here. Actually, this comes down and, and you can get in at, uh, at another place. But um, the next day after we saw Calvary, I look over to my right and there's a bus station. I've been walking past this bus station every day. And I say, wait a minute, guys. And I look behind it and there was Calvary. <laughs> And we had been walking back and forth beside Calvary every single day. And so I walked back in the parking lot, took some pictures of it. It is, it is something. Uh, you know, the neatest thing was I went and I stood at the foot of Calvary. And I thought, this is the second time I've been here. First time was June 14th, 1970. I, but, but this time I got there physically. <clears throat> so, so the fact is that there was no place called Calvary. In fact, uh, I like to think this, I'm sorry, but I like to think that the Lord was crucified in a man-made place. He wasn't crucified on something that his father made. He was crucified something that man made. So the Lord was crucified in Calvary. Calvary did not exist because, because in Genesis chapter 22, this, this stone, and it is all stone, this stone had not been removed. So there's no way in Genesis chapter 22 that Isaac could have been offered here. He had to have been offered here uh, at the rock, at the future site of the temple. <clears throat> and then um, Solomon came uh, and quarried this out. In fact, that's called his quarry. Uh, Solomon quarried this out to build, to build this, this city and the temple. Uh, and, and in quarrying out the stone, that left a thing that looked like a skull. It became known as the place of the skull. <clears throat> and they crucified the Lord. And so people were walking because that was the way into town, guys. It was just like a road. It's, that's what it was. He was, it's, it's a road today. They would walk by and that's why there was a title. Let me ask you a question. If he was crucified up here, you know what's up here? A Muslim cemetery. Now, obviously that wasn't there uh, when the Lord was crucified. But uh, if he was crucified up here, what's the title for? Who's going to walk by and see it? I know the people are there, but they're there. They know why they're there. And so he was, he was crucified, you know, kind of like, level with the road 
and they walked by and said, oh, this guy was a malefactor, the thief, uh, this guy was... This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Can you imagine what people going into town must have thought when they saw that? I mean, think about that title. People were used, in, in Roman times, they had to be used to going into a city and seeing crucified people. I'm sorry, it happened a lot. That was their capital punishment. And a lot of travelers, we don't think about this, but a lot of travelers going into cities would go by somebody hanging on a cross that had been hanging there, uh, and they would read the title. Oh, do you see, uh, we were over in such such city, and they killed two murderers. They crucified two murderers. Uh, we were over at uh, another city, and they crucified a guy that was a thief. Uh, we were in another city, and, and so, oh, who's this guy? Oh, this guy's a thief. Look at this, a thief. And come up to the next one. Well, what was this guy's crime? This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They had to be scratching their heads. Every, strangers had to be scratching their heads. And don't you think, no, come on, if you saw that and you're going into Jerusalem, what's the first thing you do? Hey, bud, you live here? Yeah, well, what is this? What is this? What did what they crucify this guy out here for? Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Well, tell me about it. What's it all about? I mean, even when he was dead, brother, they couldn't keep it out of the public. And then, of course, three days and three nights later, uh, the Lord brought to that great, that great uh, phrase that we have to light. You can't keep a good man down. Yeah. And so up he came. So um, the offering was, uh, uh, oh, by the way, this, uh, this grave, <clears throat> this grave is about 50 feet right around the, right around the side uh, from, from Calvary. So you have him, he, he takes his cross outside of Calvary, or outside of Jerusalem, about 100 yards outside. He is crucified right around the corner. He is buried in the, in the garden. Remember when uh, Mary saw him? What did she, who did she think he was? The gardener, because that was a garden. And so guys, I am pretty sure, I, I don't believe the Calvary, or the Calvary that the Roman Catholic Church built a church on uh, is, is it, because it's inside the city, and he's crucified outside the city. Um, and they also, I, don't th I think they have a grave in there, but, but this is where he's crucified. It was in a quarry. It was in a man-made place. And it does look like a, I got pictures on my phone if you want to see them. Um, it does look a little bit like a skull. There's a couple of places at, at, at a different angle, uh, which I don't have on the phone, uh, that you can, you can, you can see, you can still to this day see, that's the place of a skull. So he was, um, so when we go back to Genesis 22, and I'll wind it up, let you go. <clears throat> Um, Genesis chapter 22, when he said, uh, verse 2, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there uh, for a burnt offering. Um, that had to be here. And let me say something else about this, why, why I'm kind of glad it's the temple and not Calvary. Uh, guys, you know, you know I, am, uh, I am deaf on the fact that we all think the world revolves around us. I don't mean Gentiles. Gentiles, yes, but, but man... In general, we just think everything is all about us. And, and if, it, if, it was, if it was here, uh, I'm sorry, if, if, if this is where, uh, well, if this is where Isaac was offered, of course it couldn't have been, but if this is where Isaac was offered, then it's all about us, isn't it? Because that's what Calvary is. But what is this all about? Who's the center of the, of the, of the sacrifices at the temple? God. And guys, this may be a revelation for you, but it's all about God. It really is. It's all about God. And, you know, you go, you know, you know all this new singing, all this thing they sing and all the things they do. Uh, everybody thinks it's, you know, me and Jesus and a cup of coffee and, and God is wringing his hands that I have a wonderful life. And that's not it, guys. It is all about him. And so um, uh, this, was, uh, this was the first offering uh, on the place that someday the house of God would be, the temple. Uh, it took place here. Here's where Isaac was offered. And, um, and it is, I, like I said, it is nothing but rock. Um, let's have a word of prayer and I'll, uh, I'll give you a break. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And we do thank you for Calvary. We certainly do thank you for Calvary. And people here who will never physically stand at the foot of Calvary have already been there. They have been there and they have been there because of the blood of your only begotten son. We thank you, Lord, that... Um, not only did he die for our sins, that's good. But the three days and three nights later, he rose for our life. And we are alive because he is alive. If death could not hold him, it cannot hold us. 
So God, we thank you for your very great kindnesses. We thank you, Lord, uh, for Calvary. We glad, I'm glad there's a place on this earth that you just like. I'm glad there is. God, I pray for these people, maybe something that was said would uh, maybe clear something up in their minds. And I hope we all live to your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, take a break.